Chapter 7, Part 4 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 7 with the mule train across Nambicara land. Part 4 The third night out from Vilhena, we emerged for a moment from the endless, close-growing forest in which our poor animals got such scanty pickings, and came to a beautiful open country where grassy slopes, dotted with occasional trees, came down on either side of a little brook which was one of the headwaters of the Duvida. It was a pleasure to see the mules greedily bury their muzzles in the pasturage, our tents were pitched in the open, near a shady tree, which sent out its low branches on every side. At this camp, Sherry shot a lark, very characteristic of the open upland country, and Miller found two bats in the rotten wood of a dead log. He heard them squeaking and dug them out. He could not tell by what method they had gotten in. Here Kermit, while a couple of miles from our tents, came across an encampment of Nambicaras. There were twenty or thirty of them, men, women, and a few children. Kermit, after the manner of honest folk in the wilderness, advanced ostentatiously in the open, calling out to give warning of his coming. Like surroundings may cause like manners. The early Saxons in England deemed it legal to kill any man who came through the woods without shouting or blowing a horn, and in Nambicara land, at the present time, it is against etiquette and may be very unhealthy to come through the woods toward strangers without loudly announcing one's presence. The Nambicaras received Kermit with utmost cordiality, and gave him pineapple wine to drink. They were stark naked as usual. They had no hammocks or blankets, and their huts were flimsy shelters of palm branches. Yet they were in fine condition. Half a dozen of the men and a couple of boys accompanied Kermit back to our camp, paying not the slightest heed to the rain which was falling. They were bold and friendly, good-natured, at least superficially, and very inquisitive. In feasting, the long reeds thrust through holes in their lips did not seem to bother them, and they laughed at the suggestion of removing them. Evidently to have done so would have been rather bad manners, like using a knife as an aid in eating ice cream. They held two or three dances, and we were again struck by the rhythm and weird haunting melody of their chanting. After supper they danced beside the campfire, and finally, to their delight, most of the members of our own party, Americans and Brazilians, enthusiastically joined the dance, while the Colonel and I furnished an appreciative and applauding audience. Next morning, when we were awakened by the chattering and screaming of the numerous macaws, parrots, and parakeets, we found that nearly all the Indians, men and women, were gathered outside the tent. As far as clothing was concerned, they were in the condition of Adam and Eve before the fall. One of the women carried a little squirrel monkey. She put it up the big tree some distance from the tents, and when she called, it came scampering to her across the grass, ran up her, and clung to her neck. They would have liked to pilfer, but as they had no clothes, it was difficult for them to conceal anything. One of the women was observed to take a fork, but as she did not possess a rag of clothing of any kind, all she did was to try to bury the fork in the sand and then sit on it, and it was reclaimed without difficulty. One or two of the children wore necklaces and bracelets made of the polished wood of the tucum palm and the molars of small rodents. Next day's march led us across a hilly country of good pasture land. The valleys were densely wooded, palms of several kinds being conspicuous among the other trees, and the brooks at the bottoms we crossed at fords or by the usual rude pole bridges. On the open pastures were occasional trees, usually slender bacaba palms, with heads which the winds had disheveled until they looked like mops. It was evidently a fine natural cattle country, and soon we began to see scores, perhaps hundreds of the cattle belonging to the government ranch at Treburity, which we reached in the early afternoon. It is beautifully situated, the view roundabout is lovely, and certainly the land will prove healthy when the settlements have been definitely established. Here we revel in the abundance of good fresh milk and eggs, and for dinner we had chicken caja, and fat beef roasted on big wooden spits, and we even had watermelons. 
the latter were from seeds brought down by the American engineers who built the Madeira Maramor Railroad, a work which stands honorably distinguished among the many great and useful works done in the development of the tropics of recent years. Amlicar's pack oxen, which were nearly worn out, had been left in these fertile pastures. Most of the fresh oxen which he took in their places were unbroken, and there was a perfect circus before they were packed and marched off in every direction, said the gleeful narrators, there were bucking oxen and loads strewn on the ground. This cattle ranch is managed by the colonel's uncle, his mother's brother, a hale old man of seventy, white-haired but as active and vigorous as ever, with a fine, kindly, intelligent face. His name is Miguel Evangelista. He is a native of Mato Grosso, of practically pure Indian blood, and was dressed in the ordinary costume of the Capacolo, hat, shirt, trousers, and no shoes or stockings. Within the last year he had killed three jaguars, which had been living on the mules. As long as they could get mules, they did not at this station molest the cattle. It was with this uncle's father, Colonel Rondon's own grandfather, that Colonel Rondon as an orphan spent the first seven years of his life. His father died before he was born, and his mother when he was only a year old. He lived on his grandfather's cattle ranch some fifty miles from Cayeba. When he went to live in Cayeba, with kinsmen on his father's side, from whom he took the name Rondon, his own father's name was De Silva. He studied in the Cayeba Government School, and at sixteen was inscribed as one of the instructors. Then he went to Rio, served for a year in the army as an enlisted man in the ranks, and succeeded finally in getting into the military school. After five years as a pupil, he served three years as professor of mathematics in the school, and then as a lieutenant of engineers in the Brazilian army. He came back to his home in Mato Grosso and began his life work of exploring the wilderness. Next day we journeyed to the telegraph station at Bonifacio, through alternate spells of glaring sunshine and heavy rain. On the way we stopped at an aldea village of Nambarqueras. We first met a couple of men going to hunt, with bows and arrows longer than themselves. A rather comely young woman, carrying on her back a wicker work basket, or creel, supported by a forehead band, and accompanied by a small child, was with them. At the village there were a number of men, women, and children, although as completely naked as the others we had met, the members of this band were more ornamented with beads, and wore earrings made from the inside of mussel shells, or very big snail shells. They were more hairy than the ones we had so far met. The women, but not the men, completely remove the hair from their bodies, and look more, instead of less, indecent in consequence. The chief, whose body was painted red with the juice of a fruit, had what could fairly be styled a mustache and imperial, and one old man looked somewhat like a hairy Ainu, or perhaps even more like an Australian blackfellow. My companion told me that this probably represented an infusion of negro blood, and possibly of mulatto blood, from runaway slaves of the old days, when some of the Mato Grosso mines were worked by slave labor. They also thought it possible that this infiltration of African Negroes might be responsible for the curious shape of the bigger huts, which are utterly unlike their flimsy, ordinary shelters, and bore no resemblance in shape to those of other Indian tribes of this region, whereas they were not unlike the ordinary beehive huts of the agricultural African Negroes. There were in this village several huts or shelters open at the sides, and two of the big huts. These were of closely woven thatch, circular in outline, with a rounded dome, and two doors a couple of feet high opposite each other, and no other opening. There were fifteen or twenty people to each hut. Inside were their implements and utensils, such as wicker baskets, some of them filled with pineapples, gourds, fire sticks, wooden knives, wooden mortars, and a board for grating mandoc, made of a thick slab of wood inset with sharp points of harder wood. From the Brazilians, one or two of them had obtained blankets, and one a hammock, and they had also obtained knives, which they sorely needed, for they were not even in the Stone Age. One woman shielded herself from the rain by holding a green palm branch down her back. Another had on her head what we first thought to be a monkey-skin headdress, but it was a little live black monkey. It stayed habitually with its head above her forehead, and its arms and legs spread so that it laid molded to the shape of her head. But both woman and monkey showed some reluctance about having their photographs taken. 
Bonifacio consisted of several thatched one-room cabins connected by a stockade which was extended to form an enclosure behind them. A number of tame parrots and parakeets of several different species scrambled over the roofs and entered the houses, and the open pastures nearby were the curious, extensive burrows of a gopher rat which ate the roots of grass, not emerging to eat the grass but pulling it into the burrows by the roots. These burrows bore a close likeness to those of our pocket gophers. Miller found the animals difficult to trap. Finally, by the aid of Colonel Rondon, several Indians, and two or three of our men, he dug one out. From the central shaft, several surface galleries radiated, running from many rods about a foot below the surface, with, at intervals of a half dozen yards, mounds where loose earth had been expelled. The central shaft ran straight down for about eight feet, then laterally for about fifteen feet, to a kind of chamber. The animal dug hard to escape, but when taken and put on the surface of the ground, it moved slowly and awkwardly. It showed vicious courage. In looks, it closely resembled our pocket gophers, but it had no pockets. This was one of the most interesting small mammals that we secured. After breakfast in Bonifacio, a number of mambacaras, men, women, and children, strolled in. The men gave us an exhibition of not very good archery. When the bow was bent, it was at first held so the arrow pointed straight upwards, and then was lowered so the arrow was aimed at the target. Several of the women had been taken from other tribes, after their husbands or fathers had been killed, for the Nambaharas are light-hearted robbers and murders. Two or three miserable dogs accompanied them, half-starved and mangy, but each decorated with a collar of beads. The headsmen had three or four wives apiece, and the women were the burden-bearers, but apparently were not badly treated. Most of them were dirty, although well-fed looking, and their features were of a low type, but some, especially among the children, were quite attractive. From Bonifacio we went about seven miles across a rolling prairie dotted with trees and clumps of shrub. There, on February 24, we joined Amlicar, who was camped by a brook which flowed into the Divita. We were only some six miles from our place of embarkation on the Divita, and we divided our party and our belongings. Amlicar, Miller, Mello, and Oliviera were to march three days to the Gai Piranha, then descend it and continue down the Madeira to Manos. Rondon, Lyra, the doctor, Cherie, Kermit, and I, with sixteen paddlers in seven canoes, were to descend the Divita to find out whether it led into the Gai Piranha. Our purpose was to return and descend the Anas, whose outlet was also unknown. Having this in view, we left a fortnight's provisions for our party of six at Bonifacio. We took with us provisions for about fifty days, not full rations, for we hoped in part to live on the country, on fish, game, nuts, and palm tops. Our personal baggage was already well cut down. Cherie, Kermit, and I took the naturalist fly to sleep under, and a very light little tent extra for anyone who might fall sick. Rondon, Lyra, and the doctor took one of their own tents. The things that we carried were necessities, food, medicines, bedding, instruments for determining the altitude and longitude and latitude, except a few books, each in small compass. Lyra's were in German, consisting of two tiny volumes of Goethe and Schiller. Kermit's were in Portuguese, mine all in English, included the last two volumes of Gibbon, the plays of Sophocles, Moore's Utopia, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus. The two latter lent me by a friend, Major Shipton of the Regulars, our military attaché at Buenos Aires. If our canoe voyage was prosperous, we would gradually lighten the loads by eating the provisions. If we met with accidents, such as losing canoes and men in the rapids, or losing men in encounters with Indians, or if we encountered overmuch fever and dysentery, the loads would lighten themselves. We were all armed. We took no cartridges for sport. Sherry had some to be used sparingly for collecting specimens. The others were to be used, unless in the unlikely event of having to repel an attack, only to procure food. The food and the arms we carried represented all reasonable precautions against suffering and starvation. But, of course, if the course of the river proved very long and difficult, if we lost our boats or falls, or in rapids, or had to make too many and too long portages, or were brought to a halt by impassable swamps, then we would have to reckon with starvation as a possibility. Anything might happen. We were about to go into the unknown, and no one could say what it held. Note. 
the first four days before we struck the upper rapids and during which we made nearly seventy kilometers are of course not included when i speak of our making our way down the rapids i hope that this year the anas or pineapple will also be put on the map one of colonel rondon's subordinates is to attempt the descent of the river we pass the headwaters of the pineapple on the high plateau very possibly we pass its mouth although it is also possible that it empties into the Kanama or Tapahoe, but it will not be put on the map until someone descends and finds out where, as a matter of fact, it really does go. It would be well if a geographical society of standing would investigate the formal and official charges made by Colonel Rondon, an officer and a gentleman of the highest repute, against Mr. Savage Landor. Colonel Rondon, in an official report to the Brazilian government, has written a scathing review of Mr. Landor, he states that Mr. Savage Landor did not perform, and did not even attempt to perform, the work he had contracted to do in exploration for the Brazilian government. Mr. Landor had asserted and promised that he would go through unknown country along the line of 11 degrees latitude south, and, as Colonel Rondon states, it was because of this proposal of his that the Brazilian government gave him material financial assistance in advance. However, Colonel Rondon sets forth that Mr. Landor did not keep his word or make any serious effort to fulfill his moral obligation to do so, as he said he would do. In a letter to me under the date May 1, 1914, a letter which has been published in full in France, Colonel Rondon goes at length into the question of what territory Mr. Landor had traversed. Colonel Rondon states that, excepting on one occasion when Mr. Landor, wandering off a beaten trail, immediately got lost and shortly returned to his starting point without making any discoveries, he kept to old, well-traveled routes. One sentence of the Colonel's letter to me runs as follows. I can guarantee to you that in Brazil Mr. Landor did not cross a hand's breadth of land that had not been explored, the greater part of it many centuries ago. As regards Mr. Landor's sole and brief experience in leaving a beaten route, Colonel Rondon states that at Sao Manuel, Mr. Landor engaged from Senor José Sotero Barreto, the revenue officer of Mato Grosso at San Manuel, a guide to lead him across a well-traveled trail which connects the Tapajeros with the Madeira via the Canama. The guide, however, got lost, and after a few days they all returned to the point of departure instead of going through to the Canama. Senor Barreto, a gentleman of high standing, related this last incident to Fiala when Fiala descended the Tapajo. And by the way, Fiala's trip down the Papagao, Urena, and Tapajo was definitely more important than all the work Mr. Landor did in South America put together. Lieutenants Pyrenas and Mello, mentioned in the body of this work, informed me that they accompanied Mr. Landor on most of his overland trip before he embarked on the Arianos and that he simply followed the high road or else the telegraph line, and furthermore, Colonel Rondon states that the Indians whom Mr. Landor encountered and photographed were those educated at the missions. Colonel Rondon's official report to the Brazilian government and his letter to me are of interest to all geographers and other scientific men who have any concern with the alleged discoveries of Mr. Landor. They contain very grave charges, with which it is not necessary for me to deal. Suffice it to say that Mr. Landor's accounts of his alleged exploration cannot be considered as entitlement to the slightest serious consideration until he has satisfactorily and in detail answered Colonel Rondon, and this he has thus far signally failed to do. Fortunately, there are numerous examples of exactly the opposite type of work, from the days of Humboldt and Spix and Martius to the present time. German explorers have borne a conspicuous part in the exploration of South America. As representatives of the men and women who have done such capital work, who have fronted every hazard and hardship, and labored in the scientific spirit, and who have greatly added to our fund of geographic, biologic, and ethnographic knowledge, I may mention Miss Nethledge and Herr Karl von Dischneinen. End of chapter 7